Welcome to Emily's garden. Come on out today. Welcome to Emily's garden. Just a snap away. In this place, life is celebrated. It's the place where dreams are cultivated. Welcome to Emily's garden, just a snap away. Welcome to my garden. It's a place where dreams are cultivated. I have a great show planned for you today, all about the weather. I've invited a very special guest today to talk about the weather, and who better than Jim Corbin, meteorologist. Thank you, and I've brought some interesting gadgets that I've dealt with over the years, and uh, you know, weather is, as you say, important to everything we do. Uh, including gardening and everything else, and it's something that's been important to me since I was just a little kid. How did you become a meteorologist? Well, I had—I always liked uh, just thunderstorms and snow when I was a little kid. As a matter of fact, I loved observing the weather. This was my first weather instrument from 1972. I was a little kid. This doesn't work anymore, <laughs> but it's an, it's an anemometer, and there'd be a plug coming out of this, and you, you know those things that spin around on the roof? Yes. I got this of uh, Wallace and Beach, Don Kent, famous forecaster in, in Massachusetts. This was my first weather instrument, and I used to keep records as a kid. I'll never forget. May 9th, 1972, my first weather observations. And in fact, this is one of them right here. And if you notice, I used an address and telephone number book because I didn't have any notebooks. <laughs> so you kept a journal. I kept a journal. And in fact, the blizzard of 78 is in that one. This was a little earlier than that, but I've got the blizzard of 78 in this journal. And so again, it was something that I observed. This is all before I went to college, but you can see all the script and everything that I've got in there. And uh, somehow the ink has not dried out completely. So he's again, not kidding. Not kidding. <laughs> so I have to mention this too because yeah. I, as well, journal. I notice that yeah. things pertaining to the weather are usually two weeks for or two weeks against. Yeah. It will always go in those cycles. And the reason I did that was I ran a garden shop at one point yep. in my life. And of course, not only do you journal the weather or what might be going on with your garden, you also journal the money that's coming in and what you might have affected that. Yeah. And that's what I found. You think that you're gaining and then you'll get hit with a storm. The weather is always affecting everything, but it's almost never we don't call it normal, we call it average, because it's always either ahead or above or below or behind. It's never really where it exactly should be, I think you'd agree. You are a meteorologist, and as one might expect, that's a pretty specialized job. So it what is. are you doing now? Right now I'm doing the radio, uh, WRNP, okay. taking a break uh, from, from television for now. Matter of fact, my last day uh, was uh, Hurricane Irene. Uh, uh, live down on uh, right by the hurricane barrier in Providence and I several times we almost had trees falling on us getting up at 2 30 every morning for 10 years or so was a little so I said you know what let's take a break so took a little bit of break now back uh, uh, right in in your studios there yep. uh, with WRNP and I have to I have to comment on that that our paths have crossed before but I'm now the studio producer at AACS in Attleboro and we have an emergency system set up yes. for when there are things to happen around, which unfortunately we have to monitor. Mm -hmm. And we can let people know where the emergency shelters are. We have a generator, so we can still be fully operable at those times. So you now and I are housed in the same building. Same building there. OK, what have we got okay. besides this? OK, this is, uh, well, after I started observing, this is my, just to confirm that I did get a degree, so here's why I still have it. Somehow, <laughs> Linden State College. Calm down, I believe you. <laughs> okay, anyway, uh, we'll put that over here because I've okay. seen that enough for now. Uh, and anyway, here's a proof that I uh, did do the weather. There's one of my first uh, television stations there. Channel oh, 22. my Actually, God. Actually, it was so good that they almost cut me off in the picture. But <laughs> 
And these are the days, here's another one. This is in Vermont, when I was up in Burlington, Vermont. Okay. And this is, these are the days, Emily, where uh, we had no computer graphics, so I was writing things with magic markers. So there you go. Can you stand it? <laughs> Uh, anyway, those are the good days, and then I uh, got AMS and all that stuff uh, approval. But what kind of approval? AMS seal of approval, actually. Okay. And again, I'm bringing these up. And I'm not this confused. means for uh, means people that, I, that don't talk in letters. Well, sometimes, well, you know, it means that I somewhat know what I'm talking about. Okay. I guess. And what does AMS mean? American Meteorological Society. They're based actually in Boston, right there in Beacon Street. And uh, there's a number of which I got. This I got, you know, about thirty. 32 years ago or whatever okay. so but anyway so again it, the weather is fun and not only do I have I also love forecasting obviously I've worked in Vermont Portland Maine I did a couple of televisions in Boston not the main stations but uh, but I've been Providence up until recently uh, for, since 1995 at channels 6 10 and 12 I love forecasting but I also have always loved as I said gadgets gadgets and also observing the weather so that wind speed thing was the first thing I had. The to journal. the point of, you had a weather store? We did have one. That was recently, and that's more electronic stuff that, I'll show you maybe one thing from Who that. Who would go to a weather store? Someone who's uh, nautical, uh, boats, things for boats, things like that. More nautical. I mean, it's, as I say, when we had that store, my brother and I, my, the brother that lives up here, uh, it was over in Duxbury. Pembroke area, and uh, we well, had. There was a call for that. There was a call because there, you know, you're near the coast. It's nautical. It's not, you know, it's, we're not selling milk and bread, you know. Okay. So anyway, but that was fun. But anyway, so one of the main things we do in the, in, on the gadgets that I would have. Some of these are old. Some of them are not quite as old. But you know what this thing is, right? I think so. Yeah. Okay. This is the thermometer. This is the thermometer I used many times when I was recently at Channel Six doing live shots, and they put me out here when it's either way over here at 120 or it's way down here at 20 below they never put you outside when it's nice and comfortable around 68 degrees like it is you can see right now but i'd be out uh, downtown providence of uh, either freezing my whatever off or boiling to death when it's over 100 degrees but this is the thermometer i used but again a thermometer of course temperature this is the, the funny one I, I'll, I'll bring uh here's a thermometer now this is uh, kind of it's ragged because it's old but press that button Because the other half is broken. It's did, a talking thermometer. Did you go to sleep by this at night? Yes, I did. Uh, it, it did have, when it we used to work, the only thing that works now is what you just heard, but it used to have an alarm that would tell you, you have 10 minutes to go to sleep. You have five minutes to go to sleep, and it is 22 degrees. And it would change voices and sound, you know, almost like you know what we have now with the GPSs. Next question, did you have nightmares? Yes, I did. So put that away. I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> anyway, and here, of course, is one of the th smaller ones. But this is, as you would describe, a digital little baby thermometer. Accurite is a company. No, I don't work for them. But the point being, that it's a you know, little inexpensive thermometer you could stick anywhere. The point I'm making is what that big round thermometer was, was what's called a dial thermometer. Those are the ones that have been around for a long time, as are... The, the liquid and glass that you sometimes see on the wall. And this is still around. These are the more modern ones, digital. And we have a couple of other digital things to show you. But okay. this is all with temperature. Now, you're probably wondering, what is this crazy thing? I am wondering about that. I saw on the front of it that um, it's simply <laughs> orange. <laughs> it used to be simply orange, and I did used to drink uh, orange juice out of it. What this is, is the modern day version of a non-electronic rain gauge. Okay. So the rain, matter of fact, uh, no, I did dump it the other day. Uh, this will measure the rain. What I did is put rocks in it to, so it can weight down, and then this is the actual gauge, and it measures the rain. Now, the wider the top, the more rain that can go in, and you can see here, it's so old again that a lot of these have worn off, but one inch of rain will fill this up to right here. Okay. Two inches will fill it up to here. Okay, and you have it measured as such. So I want to stop you here. Sure. Because I'm kind of the jack of all trades as far as making something out of nothing. Yes. So I can see how this is done. You would just simply find a bottle and then any kind of a tube that would fit into the hollow of the neck mm -hmm. and you would mark it in inches. Yes. Place and it, all... it in the bottom. Yep. And obviously your measurements would also include where that bottom is going to touch because you have got it marked off in inches just so that you know you have to be precise if you really want to know. That's right. No, and that's good. We're, really, when we measure rain versus snow, 
Emily, rainfall is the amount of the height the rain would be if it wasn't running off anywhere. The modern version of everything is this electronic rain gauge, which knows the height of this, how much clearance there is, and electronically when rain goes in here, it hits a counter and it counts and you can get inches of rain on this dial here. So if we were to pour water in this right now, okay. you'd start seeing uh, the rain totals uh, increase. All right. Now this thing here, you've seen one of these. Um, can't say that I really have. What is this? This is an old-fashioned psychrometer. Ah, a have you psychrometer. Heard of those? No. <laughs> it's nothing to do with psychology or anything else. Uh, a psychrometer measures the relative humidity. Okay. And relative humidity, of course, is very important uh, for many applications, including, you know, how dry or wet not just the ground is, but other things, including the indoor humidity. If it's dry in the wintertime, you get the chap lips, you get the uh, shocks on the doorknob because static electricity likes going through dry air, okay. uh, that type of thing. What we would do is, in the old days, we'd wet the wick on here and spin, spin this thing, and there's a chart you can do. Again, this is the old-fashioned way to do it. There's a chart you can do, you look at, there's two different thermometers on here. Ooh, it clicked again. And, and, uh, <laughs> and what you would do is you'd read, this again, the old-fashioned way, but it's accurate. You would read the difference in the temperatures. One of the thermometers is going to be evaporated off, for evaporation being a cooling process, and the difference between the two temperatures, you would use a chart. And in the old days, this is how you would measure the relative humidity. Uh, this is called a sling psychrometer. Okay, that's so, very interesting. Still works, but I don't use it anymore because we have electronic thermometers. Probably a good thing. <laughs> that's right. See you walking down the street. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Uh, and by the way, this here, you're wondering, what is this? This PC. is polyvinyl chloride. And it still has the price tag on it. Okay, well. Anyway, but what we, I would use this for is a thermometer probe, like that talking thermometer had a probe. You'd stick this in, and P, PVC is very good, a very good insulator from keeping out sunlight. So you don't want sunlight to uh, affect the temperature, and that's what we call a shield for a thermometer. PVC. There you go. All right, and what else? You know, I keep eyeballing this. I know that you have this in sequential order, so no, I don't want right. to say anything. No, that's all right. Uh, it's caught my eye since you've laid it on the is, table. This is uh, a, a tied template that I have a patent for. Uh, it's really? About 20, 20 years ago, I got the patent. As I say to everyone, this is just really a prototype in terms of I have the patent, but it never really got off the ground in terms of people or me manufacturing or having someone manufacture it. Okay. But what it is is this a tied could, this template. This could be your chance today. <laughs> this is a tied template that Jim Corbin has the patent for. If there are any wannabe developers out there, I want you to listen to Jim and talk about what this is all well, about. Well, what it does is it, uh, the, the tides uh, are, there's a certain time, average tide projected out every day. And so what this is, you can turn it to a certain location uh, once. So let's say you're, he you're heading to Narragansett Beach or Horse Neck Beach and you know the tide today is high at 5 o'clock. You would set this and it, for the foreseeable future it's going to project the tide for the following day by looking at the dates on it once it's set. But the good thing about it is you can also set it by indexing around the edges which I don't have here but for other locations. So in other words it's a type of thing where say you're in a boat you can be at one port knowing the tide is in this location, and then, oh, we're headed up to Boston, and you can have it set so that the Boston tide is visible on there. It's, again, just like what we had with the, uh, the rain gauge with the plastic coming out of the, you know, the bottle a there. A little more primitive, but It's it a works. primitive, but it does work. And, again, it's not, you know, the, the invention of the paper clip or anything, but it worked. And, again, here is my, my trusty... Uh, Tied patent right here. I have it right here. Okay. My patent is five million three fifty three two sixty four. The date of the patent October fourth, nineteen ninety four. So I am proud of that. And there you have it. <laughs> my one patent that so far has not gone far, only because I didn't really pursue it. And this, I think you might know, has a relation to this. All right. And what is that? Do you think? Okay. What do you think that is? It also looks like it's tracking tides. It is. This is uh, high tide, low tide. Yes, and this this is a it's running like a clock. This is just one particular style. This is a tide clock, and what it does is it goes around. Now, not once every 12 hours, but the tides change more like 12 hours and 25 minutes. So this, in effect, is a 
clock with an hour hand that instead of go, goes 12 to 12, 12 hours, it goes around 12 hours, 25 minutes, and I think it's 32 seconds. Projected out through time, you're able to know what the tide is. And so I have this, this is what I use in the mornings when I talk to Don Katoya about the tides. This is set to the south coast, Narragansett Beach, Jamestown, and Horseneck Beach within a 15 minute average. And right now it's telling me that the tide is just past halfway out and it's headed towards low tide, and the low tide will be just a little less than three hours from this particular time of day. And the tides affect everything. Oh, they do. Absolutely everything. What else so do we, we have? Okay, here? so we'll put this tide stuff over there. This here is um, one of my primitive ways of doing the <laughs> This used to be... Uh, Lovely. I got something at the store. <laughs> this is if you have uh, nothing better to do, but uh, it's, it's a primitive wind sock, as they're called. Of course, when too the, much time on his hands. <laughs> when the wind gets into this, and you've seen these usually orange. You'll see them at yeah. They uh, can be quite lovely and oh yeah, no, imagination. Are, oh yeah. But this is but the reason I, I don't I don't have this out at where I live. But but it's an indic it's it's a primitive thing of how the wind works. And of course, if you can get wind inside this, it's going to extend it out. And not only do you know what the wind direction is, but at, especially you see them at airports. If, the, if it's straight out, there's a, there's a kind of a known thing, well, this is about 10 miles an hour, this is 20 roughly, this could be 30, 40, that type of thing. This is a primitive wind indicator, not just direction, but speed. So if you <laughs> wanted to make a wind sock, you can see how simple that is. Yeah, I can't remember what... a piece of wire so that you had an opening here. It could be anything that would be decorative that this would was, hold the wind. Yeah, and this, I can't remember what I bought that came in this bag, but okay. this is open at the top and this yep. is closed at the end. Uh, I've used and, and I've used I've used bread I've used bre packages with bread in them to make these things okay. over the years. It would be a good thing to do actually with Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts yeah. that type of thing. How would you mount this? It's upright, a okay. C clamp is often a good thing to use. Say we were to mount it here, you okay. put it on a a, a C clamp or on the top of a fence type of thing. And of course, this doesn't have to be this length; it can be any length. You okay. Know? And, and you know, I, I want to go to this next. If I if I'm not jumping the gun because this is so primitive looking. We used to sell these. We had it outside our cabin, and when it got wet, we knew it rained. <laughs> but I'm bump. Okay, but that's not, in fact, true. It's not the fact that it's wet. What happens? It's, and what oh, type of wood is this? I can't remember. I think it's, it's a type of balsa or something balsa like that. Wood. Uh, and it, uh, from a, a lot of it in Maine. Yeah. And what happens is, just because it's so thin, any kind of expansion will make the shape of this thing look different. So, as we look at it now. Today, it's, it's pretty dry out for the most part. This is dry weather. If it was to be bad, it would still look this way. This would be drooping, drooping down if you had it in this position. So it's just a novelty, a novelty stick. Some people will hang little things off of it so that it makes the tip more visible, that type of thing. Yeah, I think it's great, actually. Well, they are. And here's my, the more primitive one that I've used for wind direction. I'll take string, and uh, usually at the end, I'll, I'll tie off like a little um, straw. straw so it doesn't fall through. And I'll take the string and it's almost like lassoing, and I'll throw it up near my house or. <laughs> so you're the weather cowboy. I'm the one. So if you see things hanging from wires, uh, it's me. But this is like to weight it down. It's usually you know you need something like a like a uh, uh, what do you call a it? Nut. A nut or something yeah. like that to weight it down. Usually they fall off after a few days. But what it does is it uh, it'll be hanging, and you'll like to get this is tangled, so it should be longer. But you'll, you'll, you'll get your wind direction by looking out the window and seeing which way the string is hanging off the wire. Okay. And it's only cost about maybe eight cents, you know? If that. <laughs> if that. All right. So anyway. What else? We're getting down to the yeah, wire here. Yeah. No pun intended. No, it's all right. This is uh, probably the best thing for forecasting the weather, it's, as you probably know. What is that? This is a barometer. Barometer. One of the most important things when we forecast the weather. Higher the pressure, generally, the better the weather. The lower pressure, stormy weather. The L on the weather map is usually bad weather. Bad in quotes could mean anything. The point being, it's an indication of the weight of the air above you. The heavier the air, the sinking air is usually dry weather, high pressure, not raining or snowing. If it's lifting air, it condenses, goes up, and you have bad weather. Falling pressure means we're going to have chances, better chances of rain or snow. Of course, a barometer, Emily, can be used as an altimeter. You know, here in New England, uh, but anywhere really, weighing the air. So you could drive around, say, and know how what your altitude is. For it, you first set it, and let's say wherever you're taking off from, not just a plane, but say in your car, or your truck, whatever, and you know you're at 200 feet. There's a calculation. You can see this needle go up and down depending on your elevation, and you can tell how high up you are above sea level with a barometer. 
You know, I've always had, a, believe it or not, a love for meteorology, too. You didn't know this, but my father used to be a pilot. Um, we had a tailor craft. We had to fly dead reckoning. We put it on the road. I remember studying some of his books, the meteorology book, because we needed to know what that sky was telling us before we went up to the air. So it's much more than just gardening or farming or whatever if you're boating, yep. you're a fisherman. The knowledge of the climate of, of the area, of New England, uh, it's helpful, and I've been doing it for over 30 years now. So it, it, if you remember certain things that happened in certain situations before, that has an advantage to get making your forecast more accurate. But again, all these things that we've been showing you are all, are all measures of weather, even this thing. I mean, do you know what this is? It looks like a scale. It's a scale. Of some okay, sort. now what I do is I measure snowfall. Uh, You're kidding. The weight, of, the weight of the snow in a bucket on top of this, and I can measure the water content of the snow. And that's very important, especially how much moisture is in the soil around the area. If you have a winter that's loaded with snow that's been around, has a lot of moisture in it, uh, then in the spring you're going to get a moister soil, whereas in, uh, you might have a snowpack that has very little moisture in it. Well, we can tell by measuring the weight of snow, and this is a scale that's not used for it, but this is one of my unique things. This, this is a snow stick. Okay. Really, it's almost like having a yardstick, yep. but this one goes from 0 to 28, which is because I have these marked on here. And you can stick a, a ruler in or a yardstick in the snow. Now, let's say it comes up to 12 inches right here. Okay, so there's 12 inches of snow, but the water content of the snow might be less than other times because when you stick a ruler in snow, you say, all right, we have 12, we've got 12 inches of snow around here in the yard, but it's 12 inches of height of snow. It doesn't mean it's the mass of snow. And the rule of thumb is one inch of rain in a rain gauge is 10 inches of snow. That's the average. A very heavy wet snow, one inch could maybe be packed down to five inches. A very fluffy snow would have one inch of water, could be 18 inches of snow. So an 18 inch snowfall, yes, it's very impressive. You go around the yard, wow, there's 18 inches of snow. But if it's a fluffy snow, you can move it around very easily. Whereas you could have the same amount of massive snow in just six inches with the same water content. And you know it when you go out there to stop oh, shoveling that 18 Don't you? Tell me a little bit about global warming. Oh, uh, global warming is, it's really now because there's been a lot of uh, people against it, uh, you know, I can go either way with it. It's really now changed to climate change. Climate it's change. because in the 1970s, you might remember, some of those big magazines, Time and what have you, their front page was a big ad one, one week or whatever it was. Uh, we've got, we're going into an uh, early ice age. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in the 1970s. This is normal, though. I mean, it, we go it's through gone cyclical, through, exactly. We go cyclical, and everyone lives their life in their lifestyle, uh, and then that's it. So you might say, oh, well, if you continue to do this, then you're gonna, your grandchildren are going to be in big trouble. They will adapt to whatever they're in their generation, and then the pe the, whatever they live, they'll maybe have to move rebuild their house and move it back maybe 30 feet because that is the way it has been yes because the we centuries. the centuries uh, so uh, tell the, me what the ozone air that just uh, that does that have an effect has... on temperature i i will agree but then okay. again there have been other ways of sending particulates into the air volcanoes uh, things like that so green natural things yes happen. the natural things yeah. happen just like unnatural now i'm not in favor for shooting off uh you know gases in, into the air and smokestack. We need to protect this, our environment. And I haven't mentioned this. I'm glad we said this because okay. this is what used to be a big deal 30 years ago. And this is what I used to measure. Uh, I take the rainfall out of the rain gauge, not necessarily that one I had over there, put the water in it, and I'm able to take the pH of the water, find out if it's acidic. Acid rain. Remember that from okay. 30, 40 years ago? Yeah. And, and I just spread my lime down because I composted my front Either. garden. So we're getting into <laughs> pH, and I'm telling you, everything's related. That's Six it. months for that to break down. How about this? Is this a turkey thermometer? That's a turkey thermometer? Well, it was till I got dirt inside it. But I use this <laughs> to measure the temperature of the soil. OK. As a matter of fact, I was going to do it here, but it's fine. But right now, it's showing at air temperature. Actually, I have, I have to use a. Uh, a change here, but it's showing right now, for example, the tip of this, 8272, showing about 68 degrees right at the tip of this. Amazing. But, but if I could go down, and, and I've, I've used this over the years uh, to go down a certain amount, and you could tell the temperature difference at certain, at certain. but again, this was not made for soil, but I bought adapted it, it, adapted it. Okay. So. And you know what? We had a discussion about this. We often get into this at the station. Mm. Um, I was taught from the get-go that 
when we get into this time of year, you don't stop watering your plants if you want to yeah. keep them longer. If you water the ground, what it does is it changes the temperature of the soil. So your plants are going to last a lot longer. They're not going to freeze. So, you know, you're not going to get away with it too much longer. But, yeah, I've kept my zinnias going a lot longer than nice. most folks. Nice. And just from extra watering in the fall. That's it. That's it. Nice. Okay. Do we have anything here? Because I think we're just about Well, ending. this is the modern version of uh, what used to be uh, a long time ago. A lot of people had weather radios. And uh, let's see if it's going to work here. Did the battery run out? It might have. But anyway, weather radios are still good to have. This one is probably from about 1975. Uh, it extends out. You can see the bent thing up here. It's so, so old. But uh, you could get... Okay. And again, they're good to have because... They're good to have if you're out in the middle of nowhere, especially out over the ocean where sometimes phones don't work and you're in trouble. You might want to hear weather. Yeah. Uh, weather radios still are available. You can still get them. Uh, and I advise to have one anywhere when you go. When you say weather radios, does it just pick up? weather stations different devices will only pick up certain frequencies there's one that's in northern rhode island I think one of the hills up there there's another one uh on the cape i believe in other words the tower that picks up these forecasts it so, would tap into NOAA. it would yeah yeah and you'll but nowadays though it's instead different. of a guy or a woman doing it live on tape yeah. it's one of these automated voices you know yeah. where it sounds like and the weather for certain Boston and vicinity, and you can hear, you can hear it. it's an automated voice. Okay. But it still gives you the information. Yep. And again, this is a weather radio, but just a plain transistor radio. If you have them, they're great during a storm. Oh, yeah. um, as I said, our place, any place throughout New England and beyond, will have some place that you can tune into to find out where to go for shelter. So you should always have something. And like battery that. operated, obviously. Battery operated, because Definitely. why? The power goes out. So I'm looking at something anyway, that's caught my eye. Yep. Old Farmer's Almanac. This Here is we are. 2015. Uh, they've been doing this since 1792. A lot of great information in there, as you know. There they is. are forecasting, at least, and I kind of agree with it to some extent, uh, rather cold start to our winter, cold compared to average. There's it, a lot of folklore involved, oh, but usually there's yeah. some basis for that folklore. A oh, lot of wives' tales. I'm predicting, Mr. Here we Gordon, go. that we're going to we have go. a bad okay. winter. That's Here we go. It. Yeah, there we go. No, go ahead. And the, <laughs> we're uh, going to have a bad winter. Now, what does bad mean, though? Because I always hear when that. When I say bad, bad, I mean, some people might, if you're a skier, you're like, oh, it's going to be a lot of and snow that's this true. week. You know? That's all relative. So bad but means what? Bad for me is I yep. got to get up and I got to go in to work and I got to shovel yep. 28 inches of snow that's not fluff. Yes, ma'am. And it's High water on a yeah. regular basis. Yeah. When I foresee the signs, generally it starts with squirrels because nature takes care of itself. Fluffy tail. Is that nice, what you're seeing this nice, fall? Yes, I am. Nice, thick, fluffy tail. Wow. And there are acorns being buried everywhere because nature does take care of itself. What do you think the squirrels are sensing that we can't sense? They know what is coming. I don't know how it happens. Again, we're calling this a, a wives' tale, but I've watched well, I, the signs throughout the years, and it's generally true. So you're seeing a lot of bushy tails and a lot of acorn action with the squirrels. I am. We certainly covered a uh, lot of territory today, and I can't thank you enough for coming down. Well, thanks, Emily, for inviting me. A beautiful fall afternoon. And again, you know, the, well, these old things we show you, are, you know, old contraptions, but we're still doing the same thing every day dealing with temperature, wind, rain, snow, humidity, it all affects us in a different way, but all of us are affected whether we want to admit it or not. And so sure enough, we go from primitive stuff to the more modern stuff uh, over the last really 30 years. A lot of things have happened in technology. And that being said, I would like to invite you at a later date to go to NOAA with me. Sure. Because I'd love I that. could certainly use a guide. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We part until we meet again. See you next time here in Emily's Garden. Speak to me. Okay. Test one, two. Test three, four. Okay, you're up. Uh, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hello, hello. Brings back memories. <laughs> <laughs>